Hi there, and a very warm welcome to Season 5, Episode 7 of People Soup. It's Ross McIntosh here. I love that song because I spent so much of my life and my working life hiding who I was and pretending to be someone I wasn't because I thought I wasn't good enough. So, you know, I'm a working class girl from South London, grew up in the 70s. My niece can't still can't get her head around the fact that I talk around the fact we had an outside toilet for the first few years of my life. I mean, mum used to wash me in the sink in the kitchen and cut my hair with a bowl on my head. There is pictorial evidence, which you'll never see the light of day. But anyway, that aside, you know, so education was a way out. Mum and dad really like enforced education. And, you know, long story short, went to university, did my undergrad, went, you know, in the in the kind of early 90s, went out into the world of work. And within a few years, ended up in a in a role at the BBC in admin and then went into the psychology team. And people all spoke with really posh voices, for example. They, you know, everybody spoke in a certain way. Many of the people that worked there were from private educated backgrounds. And I just felt embarrassed. And I remember, like, after a couple of years, particularly working in the psychology team, my sister commented on that. She's like, why are you talking like that? P-Supers, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Haley Lewis. Haley is the founder of Halo Psychology, and as an occupational psychologist, she provides expert and evidence-based support for individuals, teams, and organizations going through transition. In this episode, you'll get to know Haley, and she's very open about her career experiences to date and what made her take the final leap to establish Halo Psychology. We chat about the motivation to take those leaps and how we present them to the world her approach to her profession, psychological safety, some trends in the conversations that she has with her clients, how she fits everything in, and a whole lot more. You'll also get to hear Hayley's song choice and the underlying reasons for her doctoral research topic. It was a joy to speak to Hayley, and I hope you'll feel that from this conversation. People Soup is an award-winning podcast where we share evidence-based behavioural science in a way that's practical, accessible and fun to help you glow to work a bit more often. Let's just scoot over to the news desk because reviews are in for part two of my chat with Mike Jones. On Instagram, Jill sent me a message and said, Hi Ross, loved your interview with Mike Jones. Such a good reminder to accept that life isn't always good and that well-being starts with your mind. He's totally right about your voice. Would be brilliant for mindfulness recordings. Feliz Navidad. And that's from Jill in Morpeth. Well, Jill, thank you so much for listening and for getting in touch. I really, really appreciate it. And I appreciate everyone who listens, rates, reviews and shares episodes. Thank you so much. And with your help, we'll reach more people with behavioural science that could be useful for them in the workplace. So, for now, get a brew on and have a listen to part one of my chat with Hayley Lewis. So, Dr. Hayley Lewis, welcome to People Soup. Thank you very much for having me. I'm absolutely delighted you're here. You've been on my list forever. Oh, goodness. And it's a right thrill to have you here. It's a thrill to be here. I can't wait for our chat, and I hope people get something out of it. Brilliant. I'm sure they will. (laughs) Now, you might be familiar, I've got a research department who delve into your background a bit and they've given me some notes, which I'm going to share with you. They don't always get everything right, (laughs) so... I'm nervous now, Ross. (laughs) (laughs) So it says here, Dr. Hayley Lewis is a chartered psychologist, coach, teacher, consultant, sketchnote doodler, a pracademic, all in the service of making work better. Her consultancy, Halo Psychology, works with individuals, teams and organisations in transition. Challenges like supporting leaders who've been promoted, those contemplating a career change, whether it's a radical one or a more gradual one. For instance, leaders managing a merger of two teams or leaders who are setting up a new function from scratch. These are all areas where people seek the service of Halo Psychology. And it's a consultancy that uses deep expertise in the field of psychology combined with first-hand experience of leading successful multi-million pound services. 
to help people shine, create amazing workplaces, teams and careers. How are we doing so far, <laughs> Hayley? Does this sound all right? Makes me sound like a superhero. I feel like I'm about to go, I'm Batman. <laughs> <laughs> well... I'll just go to my bat cave. Well, some people... <clears throat> me... <laughs> Do regard you as a as a superhero oh, nice. <laughs> if you're prepared to take on that mantle, or maybe maybe wear a cape. My, th- my, my, my former therapist might have some to say. I actually did have therapy back in 2005 as part of my leadership development, and one of the things that came up was my superhero or superwoman complex, so the need for everything to be perfect, being super hard on myself, putting other people first always. So it meant that I was kind of working myself into the ground. People won't be able to see it, but I've got a bit of a wry smile. Certainly I take our profession really seriously, Ross, and take our ethics very seriously and believe in being in the service of others. You know, we're here as occupational psychologists to make work better and help make organisations better. So if that gives me superhero status, then uh, yeah, I'll take it. But I probably do have kryptonite as well. Probably. I think I think we all do if we're willing to reflect on it and go there. And thanks for being so open. No, you're welcome. Peace Supers, this is just a flavour of Hayley and who she is. She's open, she's authentic, and this makes her such a great practitioner. In fact, you've been described as a combination of a high beam torch, a guardian angel, and a mountain guide mm. to support leaders in their challenges they face. Mm. And you really do bring that blend of academic rigour and real-world experience. You recently completed your professional doctorate at Birkbeck University of London, and that's part of the reason why I finally managed to get my act together and get Haley on the show, because her research is fascinating. It explored the psychological factors enabling women who run micro-businesses in the UK to succeed. And we'll come back to that a bit later on in the conversation. They've got more. Hayley is also a guest lecturer at several UK universities on master's programmes in organisational and business psychology. Says here your specialist topics are leadership and management behaviour and organisational culture and change. Mm. And that's where I first met you. When I did my master's all those years ago, I reckon it was about seven, you gave this stunning lecture about your work and your approach and it still sticks with me. Oh goodness, oh that's nice to hear. Well absolutely and I know everyone else was like, Wow. <laughs> I want to be Haley. Oh, goodness. I'll pay you later, Ross. I am, <laughs> I am really blushing now. But it's really, I've, I've sat that side of the table. You know, I remember when Paul, your buddy Paul, he and I first talked about me doing some stuff at City University. And it's really important to me. I kind of reflected on my own experience as a master's student. So I did my master's back in 99 at City. And I remember getting frustrated with some of the, particularly the professional series sessions Mm. where it felt like we were being sold to. For me, what's always at the back of my mind, whether I'm working with students, delivering lectures or working with my clients through my consultancy is always what's going to give these people maximum value. Their time is incredibly precious and their money is precious too, whether you're paying for yourself as a student, you know, and postgrad programs aren't cheap, or whether you're a public or charity sector or, or even commercial organisation trying to make ends meet. It's always really important to me that you get maximum value for time and money and, and your energy. So it's really nice to have that that feedback. Absolutely. And I also want to talk about your generosity, because you're really committed to bringing evidence-based practice to organisations. And that's not only through engagement with students and your clients, but by sharing your sketch notes, Mm -hmm. which beautifully summarise research and key messages from books and theories and models. And I'd highly recommend all the listeners check them out because they're super useful. And you can find them on Haley's social media and also subscribe to the whole back catalogue. And all the details will be in the show notes for this episode because they really are great. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's not totally altruistic. Obviously, my main reason for doing them is to to make the stuff that, that is part and parcel of, of what people like you and I do, Ross, and, and what many of your listeners do, make what we do and know and have access to accessible to others. You know, my core focus is middle managers in local government you know it doesn't mean I don't work with others but that's always kind of who I've got my eye on and there's so much brilliant research and evidence out there that we access as psychologists but other other people will never either access it or 
or when you do read it, I mean, I struggle with some academic journals, you know, I have to read each sentence 20 (laughs) times sometimes. And so I kind of see myself as a bit of a translator. If a middle manager, for example, looks at one of my sketch notes and it gives them some ideas, gives them a bit more confidence, gives them some ideas of how to work with their teams. And I see that as my job done. Even better if somebody looks at that sketch note and then they go off and want to do more reading or their own research. I love that. On LinkedIn, when people from all walks of life kind of comment and say, oh, do you have any recommended further reading? Or I'm going to just gladdens my heart. And I believe in making psychology accessible to all because mm. I just think there's also some dark side to psychology but when we use it well it can it can make the world a better place and it can make the world of work a better place and and yeah if my sketch notes do that but I just enjoy a bit of colouring in Ross getting, getting in touch with the, the four year old Taylor I find it very almost meditative I find it really soothing and, and immersive so so yeah mm. it's not totally altruistic and again, we are we are aligned on this, trying to make this stuff accessible. Mm. So it's understandable in a simple format, might provoke discussion or further learning, because otherwise it might just sit there on a shelf somewhere, exactly. or a virtual shelf, gathering dust and being of no use to anyone in the workplace. Exactly. And, and having... <laughs> having come out the other side of my doctorate I now really understand the blood sweat tears joy heartache that goes into kind of researching your studies and writing them up and yeah just as you say to have them sit there on a, on a dusty shelf whether virtual or otherwise it's just so sad it's it's a win all right I've got a little bit more <laughs> so halo Your consultancy is focused on and fascinated by the factors that enable people to thrive. Mm. Now, in our field, there are various awards, and there's quite a prestigious hit parade called the Most Influential Thinkers in HR. And Haley has appeared in those charts both in 2021 and 2022. Mm. And in typical chart tradition, she's (laughs) risen from number 21 in 21 up to number 13 this year. I'm lucky for some. (laughs) But not for not you, for me, I feel. no. And there's a whole host of other awards. Mm. Now, there was there was a career before mm. Halo. And just very briefly, because you might delve into this a bit more, Haley was an occupational psychologist at the BBC and then held a variety of leadership positions at Croydon Council, including leading on the mahusive job of communication and engagement. I know. that. Yeah, that's still... It's almost like a different me. I left local government back in 2016. So I've just entered my seventh year of business of running Halo. And I went into local government in 2005. It was a very flat structure in the psychology team at the BBC. And back then in my, I just turned 31. So very ambitious, didn't know any better. And and just saw things very traditionally in terms of work my way up. It just wasn't possible at that time. So I kind of stepped out, went into local government, had the intention of going for two years as part of my grand plan of I'm going to work in every sector as as a kind of an oxide. And it didn't quite work out that way because unexpectedly I fell completely and utterly in love with local government what it stands for when it works well you know the residents some of whom are incredibly vulnerable we're there to serve and just the wider public sector and I think the reason I ended up staying for 11 years is because well first of all I delivered you know I'm gonna I'm gonna own that I think I brought something a bit different to the table because of my background as a psychologist And so it meant that people in the local authority were really curious about me. So I ended up being kind of internally headhunted. And so the upside of that is I I kind of went into more and more senior roles, really interesting roles. The downside potentially was I was getting further and further away from kind of pure oxyc and and in particular organisational development and change and getting more and more out of my depth as well. And so what always makes me laugh is the role that I found the hardest, which was the head of communication and engagement. So I was responsible for media relations nationally and internationally. I was responsible for digital services to the almost 400,000 residents. I was responsible for public consultation where there's legal requirements, freedom of information, you know, just a whole host of things that really put me in the eye of the storm working I was working really closely with politicians from both sides of the chamber as well as working at the highest level in local and central government and I was completely out of my depth and the weird thing is that was the role I had the longest 
So whilst mm. I went in to set up the, the in-house organisational development function, I did that role. I was the head of OD for three years and the head of comms role where I burnt out. So in my first year, I, I suffered from acute stress and experienced severe burnout. So I became mentally and physically ill incredibly so it took me a good year to come back from that I'm always surprised when I'm like god I was in that role four years and and the interesting thing for me was I never certainly at the start of that role I felt like a fraud it's like I'm not I don't have a comms background you know I haven't been a journalist or in PR or anything like that and I had to really earn my stripes and and the irony is when I left that role that was my identity when I kind of launched Halo I had to do it was like Madonna I had to I had to do like a (laughs) rebrand a reinvention because on LinkedIn everybody referred to me as a comms expert and it was like no 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 I'm a psychologist is that what I trained as in the in the late 90s is what it's always been Mm. me and that took a long time to undo and to kind of get back to people realizing that I'm a psychologist but actually I think there's something also about honoring the experience of being in roles like the head of comms and you know head of customer service strategy and stuff like that I think it's what makes me attractive to clients and so I own that now I talk very passionately and with love to some extent about that time and the battle scars that I earned I always use the phrase battle scars so a lot of my senior clients in management from middle manager up to chief exec they like the fact that I've been in their shoes almost I'm not just kind of coming at them spouting a load of psychological theory and I've never run a service or had to face down a union or deal with a load of angry residents or been on the front page of the news or you know I've lived and breathed that stuff and and so that's why people, I think, seek me out. I think for a long time I was trying to kind of not cover up, but almost dim down that part of my past. And now I shine a bright light on it because it's it's part and parcel of who I am. It's why I am where I am now. And it's not separate from my identity as a psychologist. In fact, it enhances it. Here, here, absolutely. Because I think people don't talk enough about their experiences in their, their career. And particularly those times where it's been really challenging and really difficult, they tend to think about perhaps putting the LinkedIn gloss or the the polished CV about all the achievements, but they don't talk about the the corresponding challenges Mm. or dark times. Mm. And I think that is essentially human. And at the end of the day, we are all humans Mm. at work. And if we're not acknowledging that, we're creating this sort of narrative that everything is always dandy mm. in the workplace. And if it's not, and if you're talking about life as if it's not perfect, then there's something wrong with you. You're broken. And that's just not true at all. Yeah, I love what you've just said, Ross, that there's something powerful in just embracing our human condition, warts and all, the good stuff, the the not so good stuff. And I just think also it, it can make us more accessible it can it can make it easier to connect with others we connect through stories that's that's definitely a thing I learned in my head of comms role and the power of stories and I share I share lots of my stories with students with clients and the story that people certainly with my public sector clients the story that that seems to connect with them and give them hope because I want to give people hope is when I pretty much had a breakdown and kind of my way back from that because so many of my clients particularly across local government the blue light services NHS are at breaking point or have broken and and kind of by sharing my own stories and experiences some clients have said it gives them hope that there's a way back whether it's to the same thing or something different So yeah, listeners, share your stories. Yeah, and what you just said there is so important. There is a way Mm. back because we can feel utterly alone Mm. and isolated and with a mind like mine, just catastrophizing. Absolutely, yeah. And knowing that this will pass and there will be a way out of the other side is so important. But we don't know that unless people tell those stories like you are doing. That's exactly it. The most common thing I say when I, when I meet a new client, particularly for executive coaching, which is the vast proportion of the work that I do now, I'm meeting people from all walks of life, you know, from that first time manager, it's the first management role they've ever had, all the way up to kind of chief exec managing director level. And the thing so many of them have in common they, they kind of come to that first session where, where you're kind of really crystallising what is going to make the difference? What's, what's kind of your objective with this? And kind of when we start to dig deep, the thing that they all have in common, regardless of their background or 
experience, they talk about the, the issue that they're facing as though they're the only person and they're, they're faulty in some way and they should do better. And the most common thing I say to them is you're not alone. You know, I have this conversation about this issue at least a couple of times a week with other people from other organisations. And you can almost see the sense of relief from someone. So, yeah, we can think it's just us. It's just me. Everybody else seems to be coping and doing really well, whether it's dealing with a difficult member of staff or juggling all the things as a parent or a carer. And what I find, just because I'm privileged enough for people to open up to me through coaching or mentoring, is I'm kind of here to tell people, no, you're not alone. There are multitudes of you facing the same thing and you're not broken or faulty. You're doing the best you can, but let's see if we can do some things to help you do even better. Beautiful. I love that. Now we've had some amazing insights already into your career. Is there any other pivotal moment in your career that you you talk to us about? Mm. Just give us an insight into how that was, maybe the decision making Mm. or how you were at that Mm. time. I think one of the the most powerful pivotal moments, and, and it was one of the reasons that made me go into the research topic I did for my doctorate was the catalyst for me leaving a very highly paid, very prestigious role in local government to set up on my own, to set up my own business. And it was something that I'd thought about for a good few years. I think I said to you when we had our kind of our preamble, Ross, that I had like notebooks filled with ideas. I always knew it was going to be called Halo. Even back in kind of 2013, I had notes filled with ideas and the courses I would develop and the price. I even had my pricing and it almost became like the, the girl who cried wolf. I'd say to my husband I'm gonna do it I'm gonna do it I'm gonna leave I tell my friends I'm gonna leave and then at the last minute wouldn't because there was a fear particularly I'm the sole wage earner in my family my, my husband is ill so you know got a mortgage to pay and all that stuff and it was just that kind of pressure and anyway so this went on for a good few years and kind of parallel to that I was starting to do okay as the head of comms I'd come out the other side of this very dark time and I was kind of like yeah you know, I'm doing all right. But it was just always there. There was just this tiny little voice and I ignored her. Anyway, so late 2015, my dad became ill with mental health issues and it was an awful time. Anyway, long story short, he died unexpectedly at the start of 2016, the week before his 70th birthday. So he's pretty young and it knocked me and my family for six. And the voice started to get a little bit louder, but I quelled her. So carried on for a couple of months. We had dad's funeral. Mum was starting to feel tired at that point. And so to the point where the doctor referred her for some tests. And a few weeks after my dad's funeral, she got diagnosed with late stage cancer, so terminal cancer. And my husband and I, you know, we had a holiday booked just before mum's first chemotherapy treatment. And we were in in my, well, in our happy place, Dartmoor, we were walking. And and I said to my husband, I'm going to do it this time. I was 42 at that point, so early 40s, which I think is a natural point for many of us. Early 30s, early 40s, early 50s. I think our natural points for us to pause, look back at what we've achieved, but also think, do I still want to do that? And I've got all this time, hopefully, ahead of me. And that's kind of where I was. And he was like, you know that I'll support you whatever you want to do. We had enough savings behind us because we were both kids of the 70s, so quite prudent with money and had enough to cover costs for the year, like our mortgage and everything. So the weekend after my holiday, I handed my notice in and my boss had been waiting. And I think, long story short, there was something around what's the worst that could happen because the worst had already happened. I'd lost my dad and, you know, I probably had a good few years left with my mum. So I kind of started to look at leaving and setting up on my own very differently in terms of I'll give it a go. And you know what? If it doesn't work, I'll go and get another job. There's no shame in giving things a go. And so that's kind of where I was. But it kind of it then made me really curious. I remember when I went for my interview to do the doctorate. And I was asked about my motivations and, and kind of I looked at female entrepreneurship and, and women who own businesses. And one of the things I was interested in, because it was coming up in so many coaching conversations with female leaders who were thinking about setting up on their own but were frightened to, is why do we leave it to catastrophic moments to give us that courage to make the leap, whatever the leap might be? Why does it have to get to that point where a family member might die or just something awful might happen? Because that that was an interesting thing coming up in conversations with women. And so, yeah, that's that, that was one of the motivations for me doing my research. I 
think sometimes thinking about CVs, I think if people have done something unusual and gone and done something different and perhaps it hasn't worked, there's a tendency for people to want to try and hide yeah. that rather than hell, celebrate it. This makes you different. This means you took a bold move and I'm interested in people who take bold moves, mm. whatever the outcome. Mm. I love that way of looking at it. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You, you know, and it is all about the narrative you can put around it. It's what we talk about when we do work with, with organisations and teams in relation to psychological safety. I was having this conversation with a group of leaders yesterday because one of them said failure isn't an option, which was a really, so, it was a, so that was a really good starting point for a fantastic conversation with this group of leaders. We then dove into the, the kind of the theory and, and the characteristics of psychological safety and, and the things that leaders can do. And they kind of came away understanding that actually it's about changing the narrative of failure and it's mm. about the lessons that you learn. And, and so thinking in relation to what you just said, Ross, actually, it's about sharing the lessons that you've learned. If something, if you've tried something, you know, you've set up a business or done a side hustle. I hate that phrase, side hustle. But all the millennials <laughs> use it on Instagram. Um, I shouldn't use generational generalities. But um, joking aside, yeah, it's about on our CVs saying, you know, tried this, it didn't work, but this is what I learned from it and did as a result. So psychological safety isn't just for the workplace. We can use it in relation to our CVs as well. I really like that, Rosh, yeah. Because I often hear an organisation talking about psychological Mm. safety. I don't know about you, but it's one of the the key themes that is really popular. Mm. But talking about it and actually working out how you might cultivate it is a, is a totally different thing and being prepared to put the mm. hard work in including as the leader of a, of a team or a department acknowledging and owning the part that you're playing so the course that I was running yesterday was um, how to build a high performing team so we look at we it's kind of based around what the research tells us and one of the areas that we dig into as I say is psychological safety and I share it's one of my favorite studies Yes, I have favourite studies, led by Alex Newman, who is a psychologist in Australia. And it's a systematic review of psychological safety, of the the characteristics of psychological safety, but also the factors that help facilitate it. Number one, leadership behaviour and specific types of leadership behaviour. So a leader with a coaching style, a leader with a democratic approach. And so one of the challenges that I always put to groups of leaders that I work with is what are you bringing to the table in terms of that supports this and how are you behaving in a way that potentially hinders and undermines and you need to be honest with that it starts and ends with you and that's uncomfortable for some because I think some of the the, not all but some of the leaders and managers I work with it's far easier and they've learned over the years to look outside of themselves it's a broken process or it's the culture of the organization or it's this And that might be true to some extent, but you are part of the culture and you are part of the problem. And as Melissa McCarthy says in Bridesmaids, just as you're part of the problem, you're also your own solution. One of my favourite films. Can never watch it enough. (laughs) It is a superb film, which I think I watch it about once a year. So, well, whenever it's on, if there's nothing else on, I'll watch it. My husband's like, are you watching this again? Yeah, I love it. But yeah, she says that to, to Kristen V's character towards the end. She's like, just as you, your own problem, you're, you're also your own solution. And that's kind of what I say to the leaders that I, I work with. It's not just about pointing. I, I worked with a really wise woman when I went to local government, Cheryl. She's, she's an Australian woman. I was in awe of her, just so wise. And she used to say, you know, one finger pointing out, four fingers pointing back at yourself. Like when you do that, people obviously can't see what I'm doing. But yeah, when you're pointing, your, your fingers go down and point towards yourself. And that's always really stuck with me. When you point at others, you're also pointing to yourself. Beautiful, thank you. And Hayley, I've got a slightly left field question. <laughs> it's a question I ask all my guests, but a song choice. If you had a song choice that would announce your arrival in a virtual room or a real room, even in your house, for the next few weeks, months, not forever perhaps, although it might be forever, do you have a song that would that would represent you and announce your arrival? Yeah, I've got two, but if I had to choose one, it's Don't Stop Me Now by Queen. Love it. And that's, that's what I'm all about. I, I kind of just keep going. Don't. 
Stop. Absolutely. I'm, I'm going to get the hair. I don't need to get the hair brush. I'm out. having a ball. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and I, I, that's that's my hairbrush song. But I think that gets to the heart of what I've always been about is, is just like like a rocket. So so other people have used terms for me like a rocket. Just she just keeps going. That's feedback I've had in like three sixties or from friends or family. A couple of really close. They started off as work colleagues, but have become really good friends who don't know each other but have said the same thing they've said i'm like a terminator sent from the future to bust through to-do lists because i just get stuff done my husband says that as well and so yeah don't just don't stop me now i'm just going to do stuff and keep going and have fun doing it now that's really really interesting because my research department sent me this extra note and they said um this might be a bit sensitive but we think we might recommend that you put this to Haley." and they said they believe Haley may have found a way to adjust the space-time <laughs> continuum. <laughs> yeah, I always joke I should get the Hermione time turner. I get asked a lot, actually, by students or other practitioners who run their own business or how I seem to do so much. I don't work full time, you know. When I set up Halo, Fridays were always a non work day because Fridays were the day that my mum had her treatment. So I was kind of caring for my mum. And after she died in November 2020, I just kept the Friday as a non work day. And yes, but I still managed to get stuff done. And I think it's because I'm very focused on what matters. You know, I don't let email manage me. It's the other way around. And that was the same in corporate life. You know, when I was in that head of comms role in particular, I was getting anything up to like 250 emails a day. I didn't have a PA. And so I learned, you know, very quickly, you can't respond to them all. What matters? What really matters? And kind of having very clear boundaries. And and that's kind of just stood with me. I mean, I've always been like that, but it kind of amplified as I got older and and kind of went into more and more senior roles. And I've kind of just taken that into my business as well. And, and, you know, I I have a portfolio career. I don't just run Halo. There's other things that I do. And so I have to be organised. And I think it's also it also helps. And it goes back to the start of our conversation, Ross, about what, what I see my purpose as, particularly as an occupational psychologist, what I'm here to do, who I'm here to serve through the work that I do. And that kind of keeps me almost acts as a compass for keeping me true to what matters in terms of the content I produce, in terms of the work that I say yes to and the work I say no to. I sometimes say no to certain clients or certain pieces of work. Uh, and I con- I'm conscious of the privileged position around that. But I've also earned that through my experience and the, the good and the bad experience. So all of those things combined, I think, enable me to be as productive as I can whilst also looking after my well-being. Wonderful. And, and that's beautiful role modelling as yeah. well for us. And role modelling is really important to me. Again, as you and I talked about in the preamble, it's not enough for me to spout a load of stuff on LinkedIn or when I'm working with students. You know, I help manage the part one of the professional doctorate at Birkbeck. And, you know, so I feel privileged to be working and some of them might be listening to this. And I feel really privileged and take it really seriously and feel really honoured to be working with practitioners in training. So Oxykes, they've, you know, they've done their masters, some of them a long time ago, some more recently. They're doing their kind of HCPC practice logs ahead of then doing part two of the doctorate. And when we're kind of organising the weekend schools, for example, around the core disciplines of Oxyx, so around, for example, well-being or organisational change or leadership or whatever, it's really important to me that I'm role modelling the stuff that we're talking about in terms of the theory. So we had the last weekend school was a couple of weekends ago and we, it was about well-being in the workplace, which is one of the five strands of Oxyc. And it was about kind of one of the things we looked at was around work-life balance. People were feeling very tired. And it's one of the reasons why I believe in role modelling, what we're, what we're advising to our clients or what we're talking to students about to show them that it is possible. And that's always been important to me. When I was in leadership roles, the stuff that I talked about in terms of what good leadership looks like and leadership theories, again, I believed in living that. Didn't always get it right. Again, human condition, but I was certainly open to the feedback from my teams. I think it's one of the most effective ways we can spread the messages Mm. we want to spread and make things accessible is by bringing that human through that role modelling and living parts of our lives out loud 
I think it can really get people curious about what's possible. I agree. And and again, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. When we see others who are maybe not dissimilar from us doing things in a certain way and seem to be thriving, well, maybe I could do it too. That's kind of where I always want to leave people is, okay, maybe I could do it too. It's not just for the, the kind of the privileged few. But as with anything, I think sometimes when I mentor so whether I'm mentoring a new business owner, so a woman who's kind of left corporate life to set up her own business, or whether I'm mentoring a student in the field of occupational psychology, so starting off on their journey. And I think sometimes we can all fall into this trap. They're comparing where they are now with where I am now. And I have to kind of gently remind them what you're not seeing is that, you know, particularly with with new folk in the field of Oxyc. The last session I ran at City earlier this year, I had a couple of the students contact me after and send really lovely feedback. But, you know, they they were feeling quite overwhelmed. And, and I said, you're at year one. I'm at year 25. Yeah, absolutely. Don't compare. Compare your year one with my year one, where I made all sorts of mistakes, tripping over myself all the time as a, doing all sorts of things and, and learning from the mistakes. So... Yeah, I think let's not compare ourselves to to where we are now, to to where somebody else is, because they're completely different journeys. Yeah, it's when we imagine a famous sports person, you think, oh, I'm going to take up that sport. (laughs) And then we get a bit and then we get a bit despondent when we realise we're we're not quite ready for Wimbledon yet. Why can't I run 100 metres in nine (laughs) seconds? And that's a really important point, Ross, because it's all the hard work and the battles and the lessons learned and the consistent showing up that sits behind that achievement. And that's what I talk to students and some of my clients about. And again, it came up yesterday with this group of leaders, as I say, that I was working with. And it comes up quite a lot on the how to build a high performing team course, because I'm talking about kind of best practice and I share kind of evidence based tools and techniques that they try out and what the evidence tells us. And you can see some of them sitting there going, oh, my Lord, I'm tired looking at the and I call them out on it. Because everything's a choice. And I say, you know, you, you're probably sitting here looking at this, some of you thinking, oh, this is too much like hard work. <laughs> and that's completely justified. And so you have a choice. Your choice is to carry on as you are, which is a legitimate choice. It's absolutely fine. Are you going to take your team to the next level? Maybe not. But own your consequences of that choice. Do you want to take your team to the next level? Well, then you might need to try some different stuff and be consistent in applying that and I say this to some of my clients you can't have your cake and eat it you can't magically click your finger or wriggle your nose like Samantha in Bewitched and and suddenly everything's sorted it requires us as as people to show up consistently every day you know it's those incremental gains and even on those days where it feels really hard keep keep go- don't stop me now keep going and not everybody's kind of prepared to do that and there's no judgment for me that's okay but take the consequences of that choice and we don't always want to do that love it showing up absolutely but owning your choices yeah and realizing that that is a choice yeah. not doing something is a, is a legitimate choice there's pros to that, but there's cons to that, and own it. And and that's often the bit that's missing. I'm getting on my high horse now, Ross. I love it. I love <laughs> it. Now, being of a curious nature, I also need to ask, you said you had two choices for your song. What was the second choice? Um, this is me. It's from the film The Greatest Showman, sung by ah. Kiala Seppel. I mean, I can imagine some of the listeners rolling their eyes going, oh, God, that's such an obvious choice. And it probably is. But it really... I love that song because I spent so much of my life and my working life hiding who I was and pretending to be someone I wasn't because I thought I wasn't good enough. So, you know, I'm a working class girl from South London, grew up in the 70s. My niece can't still can't get her head around the fact that I talk around the fact we had an outside toilet for the first few years of my life. I mean, mum used to wash me in the sink in the kitchen and cut my hair with a bowl on my head. There is pictorial evidence, which you'll never see the light of day. But anyway, that aside, you know, so 
education was a way out mum and dad really like enforced education and you know long story short went to university did my undergrad went you know in the in the kind of early 90s went out into the world of work and within a few years ended up in a in a role at the BBC in admin and then went into the psychology team and people all spoke with really posh voices for example that you know everybody spoke in a certain way many of the people that worked there were from private educated backgrounds and I just felt embarrassed and I remember like after a couple of years particularly working in the psychology team my sister commented on that she's like why are you talking like that it was even affecting how mm. I was talking. But I was in this team where everybody was chartered. They were younger than me. They were getting chartered. Chartership at that point wasn't a possibility because I didn't have graduate basis registration. And I, I just felt fraudulent. And I was constantly comparing myself to others and thinking if I was more like them, I'd be better. And so I kind of almost lost who I was. I didn't even know who I was and I was pretending to be other people. And that kind of even continued into local government. And and this is why the work that I did with a therapist just a few months before I went into local government, um, I had the option of going on the leadership programme at the BBC. And because I'd, I'd helped design part of that and I was facilitating part of it, I was like, mm, I'm not sure that's the best use of money. Actually, I think I need something deeper. And my boss at that time said, yeah we'll happily pay for an executive coach with a therapeutic background and the work I did with her was deep it was hard it was grueling um, but I came out the other side starting to understand who I was and be proud of that warts and all and so that's why the song this is me really resonates quite deeply now I think at the age of 48 I'm, I'm not too far off 49 it's taken me a long time to get here and I think as a woman as well, I think you get to a certain age as a woman and you just don't really care what people think of you. And I'm kind of at that point. So, yeah, this is me. That's why that song resonates. Well, personally, thank you for being a role model to, to more people than you might imagine you're a role model for. It's really, really appreciated from here. You're welcome. That's it, folks. Part one in the bag. Thanks so much to Hayley for being so open and for being such a role model for us all in the workplace. Next time, we'll continue our chat and jump right into Hayley's research. If you like this episode of the podcast, please could you do three things? Number one, share it with one other person. Number two, subscribe to the podcast and give us a five-star review, whatever platform you're on, and particularly if you're on Apple Podcasts. The Apple charts are really important in the podcast industry. And number three, share the heck out of it on the socials. This will all help us reach more people with stuff that could be useful. I love to hear from you, and you can get in touch at peoplesoup.pod at gmail.com. On Twitter, we are at peoplesouppod. On Instagram, at people.soup. And on Facebook, we are at peoplesouppod. Thanks to Andy Glenn for his spoon magic and Alex Engelberg for his vocals. Most of all, dear listener... Thanks to you. Look after yourselves, peace supers, and bye for now. And I'm kind of at that point. So yeah, this is me. That's why that song resonates. Excellent. I'm giving it to you. Thank I'm you. giving it to you all on a plate, aren't I? You are. There are you no are. secrets. Like... There are no secrets here. <laughs>